Heisenberg is without doubt one of the most gifted men in theoretical physics, and nobody can resist his cleverness and charm. The problem is whether to mix politics up with scientific questions. Max Born, October 18, 1948. In June 1939, 37-year-old Werner Heisenberg went on a trip to America for a cosmic ray symposium, and everywhere he went, everyone wanted to know why, why, why was he staying in Germany? He wasn't an obvious anti-Semite. In fact, he had lost most of his friends, mentors, and students to Hitler's racism. And he had just went through an SS investigation because prominent Nazis wanted to label him and all theoretical physics and physicists Jewish filth. As the amazing nuclear scientist Enrico Fermi's wife Laura put it to him, quote, anyone must be crazy to stay in Germany. Heisenberg hemmed and hawed about it and basically left it with, Germany needs me. A month later, he returned on a nearly empty boat to Germany, and a month after that, on September 1st, 1939, Hitler attacked Poland and started World War II. By September 25th, Heisenberg joined the Uranium Club to try to develop nuclear bombs for Hitler. So the question remains, why? And to understand it, I think we need to look a little bit back into Heisenberg, why he became famous, and how he passively dealt with Hitler before 1939. Ready? Let's go. Electricity, 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 electricity. I would like to start in the fall of 1922, 11 years before Hitler came to power, when a 20-year-old Werner Heisenberg went to Göttingen to take a class from the delightful Max Born on new quantum theories. Even though the class was attended by Heisenberg's friend, Wolfgang Pauli, and a visiting scientist from Italy named Enrico Fermi, Born was most impressed with Heisenberg and offered him a postdoc position, which he accepted in 1923. Two years later, Heisenberg went to Born with what he called was a crazy paper that he didn't dare turn in on his own. Born started thinking about it day and night. Then one morning, Born recalled, quote, I suddenly saw the light. Heisenberg's symbolic multiplication was nothing but matrix calculus, well known to me since my student days. Although Heisenberg complained that he didn't even know what a matrix was, he quickly learned, and for the next six months, Heisenberg, Born, and a fellow student named Pasquale Jordan created matrix theory. Then mere months later, a 39-year-old Austrian named Erwin Schrodinger published his wave model, which he said was partially motivated because he, quote, felt discouraged, not to say repelled, by Heisenberg's method of transcendental algebra. Threatened, Heisenberg wrote Wolfgang Pauli, the more I reflect on Schrodinger's theory, the more disgusting I find it. I consider it to be crap. Turns out both methods work. Anyway, in the fall of 1926, the famous Danish scientist Niels Bohr invited Heisenberg to Copenhagen to try to solve this dilemma. While in Copenhagen, Wolfgang Pauli sent Heisenberg a really strange result. In theory, the more he studied the position of a particle, the more difficult it became to study its momentum, mass times speed, and vice versa. Heisenberg then used the new laws of quantum mechanics to derive this relation now called the uncertainty principle. This theory was even more hated by Schrodinger, and soon there was two competing camps. The Berlin camp, headed by Schrodinger and supported by the old guard, Max Planck, Arnold Sommerfeld, and Albert Einstein, and what Heisenberg called the Copenhagen view, led by Heisenberg and Pauli and Max Born, and of course, Niels Bohr. Soon, all international and local physics colloquia were taken over by this debate. By February of 1928, 26-year-old Heisenberg was so famous he was made the youngest full professor and the head of the physics department at the University of Leipzig. Then, in October of 1929, the American stock market fell off a cliff and the faltering economy dragged the whole world into a global depression, especially in Germany. Desperate, 
many Germans turned to either the communists or a group of racists led by a buffoonish moron named Adolf Hitler. Heisenberg didn't like either group and started to focus on his philosophy that was born of his days in the German Boy Scouts called the Pathfinders, which was a pseudo-religious paramilitary group dedicated to revitalizing German honor and a rebirth of chivalry of medieval knights. This wasn't a passing childhood phase. For example, in 1945, an allied scientist named Goldschmidt said that Heisenberg tried to justify his actions during the war by spouting some abstract parallel or relationship between Christian ethics, knighthood in the Middle Ages, and the Nazi doctrine. Not surprisingly, the Pathfinders morphed into the Hitler Youth Movement of the 1930s. Anyway, back in 1932, despite the fact that Hitler only won 37% of the vote, the president and the parliament were so scared of the communists that they made Hitler chancellor. After the communists were blamed for a fire in February of 1933, Germany declared martial law, and by the end of March, Hitler was able to pass any law he wished without parliamentary approval. Hitler immediately used his power to make life miserable for his Jewish subjects, and on April 7th, he enacted a law that all communists and Jewish people had to be fired with the exception of World War I veterans. That meant doctors, lawyers, musicians, and most importantly to Heisenberg, university professors. Max Born, who was Jewish, ran off to the Italian Alps, and Heisenberg turned to the elder Max Planck for advice. Heisenberg then learned that Planck had actually personally talked to Hitler, but got nowhere convincing Hitler to keep Jewish scientists in Germany. Many people noted how despondent Planck was after the conversation, but Heisenberg seemed to have gotten a very different vibe. Planck was apparently convinced that Hitler was so pathetic he was not long for power. And Heisenberg wrote Born, quote, Planck has spoken with Hitler and received the assurance that the government will do nothing beyond the new law. I would ask you not make any decisions yet, but wait and see how our country looks in the fall. Born agreed to try to delay, but within a month, Wolfgang Pauli, who also had a Jewish background, but was safely working in Switzerland, found Born a job in Cambridge, and Born stopped waiting for Hitler to relent or be removed from power. At the same time, Heisenberg's rival, Erwin Schrodinger, who was not Jewish, decided it would be fun to go to England, which was taken as a rebuke of Hitler, leaving Heisenberg feeling like the most important supporter of theoretical physics left in Germany. By the way, Schrodinger never publicly denounced Hitler, and in 1936 moved back to his native Austria, and in 1938 published a disturbing pro-Nazi article to try to suck up to the regime as they rolled into town. Although Schrodinger was fired anyway for political instability and got scared and ran off to Ireland, Schrodinger never publicly denounced his own repulsive words. Anyway, Back in late 1933, Heisenberg learned that he was being awarded the 1932 Nobel Prize in Physics a year late. And Heisenberg wrote Born that he was embarrassed to earn a Nobel Prize without him. There was then talk of giving Heisenberg Max Born's old position in Göttingen, hard word to say, and Heisenberg wrote in early 1934 to James Frank, his other mentor from there, Quote, I feel that a long time will pass before such a time of scientific enthusiasm will be possible once again in Germany. But I want to hold out here that I will do everything in my power for our Göttingen, you may be sure. However, by spring of 1934, a Nobel Prize winning ass named Johannes Stark, who was a very early promoter of Hitler, an obsessive anti-Semite, became chair of the German Research Foundation. And at his first action, he ceased research funding for all theoretical work and even restricted what experimental work got funded to Aryan topics. Heisenberg continued to be able to do research with other funding, but he lost out on the position at Göttingen. And he decided that the Nazis weren't going away as he had hoped and mulled over joining an army sports camp to quote, acquaint myself a little more with this politics. But he didn't get around to it, and it became a moot point as he was then drafted as an army reservist. Also, in May 
of 1935, he heard that four professors at the University of Leipzig were going to be fired despite the fact that they were all World War I veterans. Heisenberg and five other professors formally voiced their objections at a faculty meeting. Heisenberg said it was inconsistent with the intention of the law. This went nowhere, and Heisenberg wasn't fired, but he became the focus of more and more vitriol, especially from Johannes Stark. Then, in September of 1935, Hitler used an annual rally in Nuremberg to announce new, stricter laws specifically attacking German Jews from almost all employment and removing the limitation on World War I veterans, as well as many other racist edicts. Heisenberg decided it was pointless to object to anything anymore and wrote his mother, the world out there is really ugly, but the work is beautiful. Also in 1935, Arnold Sommerfeld, who was Heisenberg's PhD advisor, wanted to retire and promoted Heisenberg as his replacement, which seemed like it might work out. But then in December of that year, Johannes Stark gave a speech where he railed on how it could be possible that Heisenberg's spirit of Einstein's spirit is now to be re rewarded with a call to a chair. The appointment was postponed and Heisenberg wrote his mother, I can wait. This complete idiocy cannot last forever. But the idiocy just seemed to grow and become an attack on all theoretical physics. Meanwhile, Heisenberg ended up going to Bavaria to do his six weeks of military training, which he adored, writing his mother, quote, it's nice not to have to think about things for a change, but only to obey. The duty agrees with me in every respect. By the end of 1936, Heisenberg was back at his desk and got together with many other scientists to create a petition for the need for theoretical physics, which was signed by nearly every prominent physicist remaining, 75 in total, including many Nazi party members. It seemed like Heisenberg had won. By March 1937, Heisenberg was told he could have the position if he wanted it. And he accepted, but with a slight delay. As Heisenberg had just met a young woman named Elizabeth Lee Schumacher in January and was busy arranging their marriage for April, he worked fast. This gave Stark time to renew his attacks. And on July 15, 1937, Stark published a full page ad titled White Jews in Science that called Heisenberg and for good measure, Max Planck and Arnold Sommerfeld, quote, bacterial carriers of the Jewish spirit who must be eliminated just as the Jews themselves. Incensed, Heisenberg wrote to Heinrich Himmler himself and demanded an investigation and an apology. Yes, that Heinrich Himmler, Hitler's number two guy, and according to Wikipedia, one of the most powerful men in Nazi Germany and a main architect of the Holocaust. In the Prince Albrechtstraße. Himmler ordered Heisenberg to the Prinz Albrechtstraße, which at the time was the headquarter of the Nazi terror machine. And there he waited for hours, without Himmler seeing him. Himmler was in the office next door, asking all the time, is he still sitting there? Is this Heisenberg still sitting there? All we know is that he was very shaken when he returned home from these interrogations. While he was waiting there to be questioned, he had heard other people being interrogated. He had heard the cries and the beating. Heisenberg even had his mother ask Himmler's mother to look into it and also take it easy on her boy. Heisenberg wrote Arnold Sommerfeld that he would leave Germany if the defense of my honor is refused, as he had, quote, no desire to live in Germany as a second-class citizen. Heisenberg didn't seem to see the irony in staying in a Germany where other people were being treated as second-class citizens, or slaves, or being starved to death, or mass murdered. In July of 1938, Heisenberg heard the good news that Himmler would support Heisenberg as long as Heisenberg didn't get too political and quantum mechanics and relativity could be taught in school. Heisenberg was victorious and he had a very powerful ally in Himmler. Strangely enough, this whole escapade made Heisenberg a willing tool of the Nazis. He had made a Faustian bargain. 
He would support the regime no matter what, as long as he was a first-class citizen and was allowed to study theoretical physics. Heisenberg felt he had to ignore politics in order to save German science and decide not to worry about the moral implications of working for Nazis or the ramifications of his science research. Nine days after the good news from Himmler, Heisenberg's new morality was put to the test. As he found himself in uniform with thousands of other Germans, getting ready to attack Czechoslovakia for Hitler. Luckily for Heisenberg, Hitler signed the Munich Treaty with England, France, and Italy to get part of Czechoslovakia if he promised, special pinky promise, to stop there. And British Prime Minister Chamberlain proclaimed, peace for our time. By October, Heisenberg was back at his desk at Leipzig. Then on November 9th, 1938, all of Germany erupted in mob violence specifically against the Jewish population. Two days before, a Jewish teenager living in Paris had shot a diplomat as revenge for how his parents and other Jewish people were being treated by the Nazis. And Hitler decided it was a grand Jewish conspiracy. And Himmler and Goebbels decided to arrange spontaneous protests. Soon mobs of people were burning, looting, and killing and desecrating graves and synagogues. The head of the American consulate in Leipzig described it as, quote, the most violent debacle the city has probably ever witnessed. He then went on to describe how their consulate was inundated with desperate, bloody, and beaten people, where, quote, most of these visitors were desperate women as their husbands and sons had been taken off to concentration camps. Heisenberg knew about most of this and wrote his mother how he was, quote, still completely in shock from the last nights. However, Heisenberg, like the majority of his countrymen, decided to stay silent and instead looked for a country house for his wife and two going on three children in the calm of the country, went back to his campaign to replace Sommerfeld by continuing to write to Himmler. The international political community acted very much like Heisenberg, shock and dismay, followed by not much of consequence. But for ordinary people living inside and out of Germany, it was becoming more and more clear that Hitler was evil. Hitler tried to downplay his role in the Night of the Broken Glass, or Kristallnacht, but he learned that he could do what he wanted with little repercussions, and Kristallnacht is often considered the starting date of the Holocaust. Now finally, we get to nuclear fission. In January 6, 1939, the German chemist Otto Hahn and his assistant published their startling results that when uranium was bombarded with slow neutrons, sometimes the heavy uranium nucleus split in what is called nuclear fission. By February 11th, Hahn's longtime partner, Lisa Meitner, who had actually described to Hahn what was going on with nuclear fission, and her handsome nephew, Otto Frisch, published an article on the physics of nuclear fission and how the new configuration would have slightly less mass and correspondingly energy from E equals mc squared. Hahn and Meitner published separately because Meitner had a Jewish background. In fact, Meitner had just escaped Germany. Frisch noted in his autobiography, quote, in all the excitement, we'd missed the most important point, the chain reaction. However, that would come soon. By March 1939, Frederick Joliet and his wife Irene Curie, daughter of Marie Sklodowska Curie, published that nuclear fission produced more neutrons than it absorbed and therefore could cause uranium to have other nuclear reactions in a chain reaction. Although it still seemed unlikely, a nuclear bomb was possible. By the end of April, the New York Times was proclaiming, quote, scientists say that a bit of uranium could wreck New York. Just a few weeks later, Heisenberg was on a boat to the United States for a symposium, as I described in the introduction. When Heisenberg returned to Germany, he regaled his family with stories of an explosive that could destroy New York. I guess he read the New York Times article and his theory that whoever possessed this first could blackmail the whole world. Then, to no one's surprise except for maybe Neville Chamberlain, Hitler violated his treaty with England, France, and Italy, made a secret pact with Russia, and attacked Poland on September 1st. Heisenberg waited, ready for his call to the front. 
Instead, he was called to go to Berlin. And in Berlin, he was asked to join the Uranium Club by an old friend and former student of his named Carl Frederick von Weissacker. After the war, Weissacker said that Heisenberg wasn't hard to convince and told him, quote, Hitler will lose this war. It's like the end game in chess with one castle less than the others. He will lose his war. Consequently, much of Germany will be destroyed, but the value of science will still be there and it is necessary that science should live through the war and we must do something for that. However, Hitler was far more successful than Heisenberg expected and within nine months, Germany had overrun Belgium, the Netherlands, Luxembourg, and signed an armistice with France. Heisenberg was floored and then decided that Europe was weak and that it was a decision between Hitler and Stalin. And as he told a friend in 1943, quote, it has always been the historic mission of Germany to defend the West and its culture against the onslaught of Eastern hordes. And the present conflict is one more example. Perhaps a Europe under German leadership might be the lesser evil. When the friend objected, especially because of what he called the mad and cruel anti-Semitism of the Nazis, Heisenberg basically shrugged and said it would all be better once the war was over. And besides which, most of the things were on the East and the hordes there and not in good Nordic places. Blech. Note that while Heisenberg was convinced that Germany was gonna win, he still worked on nuclear research, even complaining about lack of funding as he continued to look for validation of theoretical physics worth to the regime. Once the war seemed lost, Heisenberg went back to feeling like he did in 1939, that he needed to work on nuclear physics so that German science embodied in him personally had a ticket to deal with whatever regime would come out on top. Heisenberg's actions weren't a secret. Everyone knew that Heisenberg was working on nuclear research. In fact, the head of the department to investigate enemy research said, no one but Professor Werner Heisenberg could be the brains of a German uranium project. Every physicist in the world knew that. And when Heisenberg was captured in 1945, they labeled him in their communications as, quote, the leader of the German atomic weapons program. And it was fear of Heisenberg in particular that inspired so many scientists and politicians to devote so much money and time to the development of the nuclear bomb. This brings us to one of the biggest mysteries of physics history. In the fall of 1941, Werner Heisenberg went to Nazi-occupied Denmark. According to Niels Bohr and other contemporaries, Heisenberg started spouting off about how great Germany was and how happy everyone should be that Germany is definitely gonna win the war and there's no point in resisting it at all. And then, according to Bohr, quote, I also remember quite clearly our conversation in my room at the Institute, that under your leadership, everything was being done in Germany to develop atomic weapons and that you had spent the last two years working more or less exclusively on such preparations. Which leads to the mystery. Why would Heisenberg tell Bohr about the bomb? You can bet that Robert Oppenheimer and Enrico Fermi weren't going on vacations to tell foreign scientists about their work. Why was he doing it? Did Bohr remember the event correctly? Was Heisenberg warning Bohr, trying to recruit Bohr, trying to scope out the competition, trying to get absolution? Bohr could never figure it out. It seems so ironic. So much uncertainty around time, around memory, around morality, around science, all from the creator of the uncertainty principle. That would make a fabulous play. It is a fabulous play. I assumed like most others that the answer to this riddle would always remain uncertain, but I researched it and I think I've solved it. And I'll tell you next time on the Lightning Tamers. Thanks for watching my video. If you liked it, please give me a thumbs up and a comment. If you didn't like it, please give me a thumbs down in the comment because that helps me too. If you liked it a lot, please consider being a Patreon. There's a link down below. Thank you, Patreons. And remember, stay safe and have a good day. Incest. Incensed? 
incensed. Incensed. Han, uh, hi. Incensed. Han, uh, Heisenberg. Inc too many H's. Incensed. 